Now, let's thank and acknowledge our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. All right, without any further ado, let's get started. Our first of today's speakers is a professor of physics at the University of California, San Diego, and is also the director of the Cool Star Lab there at UCSD. An observational astrophysicist, his specialties are stellar spectroscopy, stellar magnetic emission, and low mass binary systems, all topics which will surely come into play today as he discusses brown dwarfs and how we can observe their weather from Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Adam Bergasser. Dr. Bergasser, you can take it from here. All right, thank you very much, Lauren, and thank you everyone for attending today. I'm gonna go ahead and set up my slides here. Um, and as I do so, just a, another double shout out, shout out to Boyce Astro, who is actually in San Diego, uh, where I'm from. So it's great to uh, have uh, them sponsoring this talk as well. Um, today, I'm gonna to be talking about uh, an area of astronomy uh, called substellar astrophysics, and we'll unpack all those words in a moment. Um, but one of the things that I thought was most interesting about this area of research that I've been working on for the last 20 years, um, and I thought very interesting for the uh, AABSO, um, is the fact that these objects are variable, and that variability is tied not to our traditional uh, stellar variability like star spots and um, you know, solar flares and stuff like that, but to uh, things that we think more in the line of planetary atmospheres, and that's clouds and weather. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is, is how we know that there are clouds on these objects called brown dwarfs. I'll explain what brown dwarfs are as well. Um, and then how we use these, uh, the, the variable light curves to study the atmospheres of these objects in pretty incredible detail in terms of both horizontal mapping and vertical mapping of the cloud decks which we can do by using time-dependent uh, data, just like, like you do for, for your variability studies as well. Uh, so that's the topic of my talk, and we're gonna talk about the weather uh, on brown dwarfs, which is, uh, you know, some of you put in the chat window, you've got your own weather at home. Um, and we're gonna see that brown dwarf weather is a little bit different, um, and particularly what kind of things uh, is raining and snowing in their atmospheres. So uh, let's uh, just start by, thinking about the clouds. Right? So, you know, depending on where you are today here in San Diego, it's pretty overcast. Uh, it's not our usual sort of sunny San Diego day. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty white out there. Um, and of course, you know, clouds come in all kinds of different uh, sizes, designs, shapes, colors. You know, we have our sort of fluffy, beautiful white clouds and a blue background. Um, we could have dark, black, stormy clouds uh, in, a, in a thick rainstorm. Um, we have, you know, during the sunrise and sunset, we can have all kinds of different colors, pink clouds, purple clouds down at the beach, uh, beautiful orange clouds at sunset when we have a lot of material in the atmosphere. Um, you can even have, this is a picture I took in Northwest Montana, uh, clouds that are multiple colors all at the same time. This was a, a red, white, and blue cloud day that I had uh, just back uh, uh, last year uh, when we were still traveling out in, the, in Northwest Montana there. Um, sometimes the clouds are thin and wispy and, and whimsical. Uh, sometimes the clouds are dark and thick and menacing uh, with storms. Uh, and of course, these clouds produce uh, the rain showers uh, and snow showers and, and hail, depending on what climate you're in. Um, we can have clouds uh, that also produce lightning, of course. Um, clouds can come into different kinds of shapes, uh, depending on what kind of uh, storm system you have. You could have these small, well, relatively small tornadoes uh, or water spouts if you're over the ocean or tremendously large hurricane systems. So they come in different structures as well as different colors and, and materials. Uh, 
Um, we see clouds at all different layers in our atmosphere. Uh, the highest clouds are these nosolucent clouds that uh, are very you know, close up to the kind of edge of our atmosphere and are glowing because they're reflecting the sunlight that they're picking up from, uh, from around the limb. Uh, and of course, if you're in San Francisco, you're familiar with the clouds that are just sitting right on the bay, uh, very low to the ground. So clouds not only have different shapes and colors, but they can also reside at different parts of our atmosphere. Uh, clouds could have funny shapes too. Uh, these are mummelet clouds. Uh, this comes uh, from the convective turbulence uh, that happens in thunderstorms. Uh, you have these kind of weird alien clouds, these lenticular clouds that can form also in different conditions uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, and then if you're a physicist and in, in, you occasionally see clouds like these, these are Kelvin Helmholtz clouds and these form at the interface of two layers of atmosphere moving relative to each other and produce a fluid instability that produces these beautiful shapes uh, in the clouds. So, um, you know, there's a huge variety of the shapes, sizes, appearances, how they reflect light. But the thing about earth clouds is that they're basically all made out of the same stuff, water, right? Water in either liquid or ice form, that's our main condensate in the atmosphere that forms these clouds. And of course, clouds are important for the Earth uh, in terms of how uh, light gets to our surface, how it's absorbed back. Uh, clouds are one of these uh, uh, aspects of, for example, of climate change that people are still trying to figure out. Do clouds warm the environment? Do they cool the environment? Do we expect to see more clouds as the climate uh, heats up or do we expect to see less? Um, but just looking back at our Earth from space, clouds are an important aspect of it, right? We, we, this you know, very famous blue marble image taken by the, the crew of the Apollo 17 back in 1972, you know, uh, obviously clouds are a big part of this, right? The reflectance of those clouds, uh, these beautiful uh, weather patterns that tell us that we have an active hydrosphere on our planet. And in fact, this is so natural to us that if we see pictures of the Earth without clouds, and NASA has constructed uh, mosaics of our planet. Uh, this is kind of their update to the blue marble where they've taken thousands and thousands of images from the MODIS satellite uh, system and stitched together what our cloudless earth would look like. It actually looks fake. <laughs> this looks like something that uh, could have been created in, a, in an art uh, Photoshop uh, environment or some kind of you know, uh, a model or something like that. These are real images of the earth taken without the clouds and it's just weird to see our planet cloud free like this. So clouds are obviously a very integral part of our planetary system of our atmosphere. And of course, they're very important for weather and ultimately life. It's part of our hydraulic cycle. Now, there are clouds on other uh, planets in our solar system, um, and they are a lot more diverse. So if we look at closer into the sun, uh, Venus has these incredibly thick cloud layers that are primarily made of liquid sulfuric acid very different kind of weather on that planet, right? Um, and that has a lot to do with the fact that Venus is much hotter and the clouds don't, uh, cloud, water doesn't condense out into vapor, uh, sorry, into liquid or solid uh, clouds. And so you have to have a different species, in this case, sulfuric acid that provides these condensate clouds. Uh, Mars also has clouds in addition to its dust storms. It has uh, water ice clouds, uh, particularly near the poles, which can be seen uh, at different, uh, different times of year. And of course, uh, the other major atmosphere in our solar system, at least in terms of small terrestrial bodies is Titan, which also has a very thick cloud layer in this case of methane ice. So beyond the earth, clouds can be made of other substances beyond uh, just water ice and water liquid. Uh, you can have liquid sulfuric acid and methane as well. And of course, if we turn, these are just the terrestrial planets. If we turn now to the giant planets, they're all clouds to some degree, right? They are such thick atmospheres that you find many different layers of clouds uh, visible either at the surface or just under the surface. Um, and that uh, gives rise to the beautiful structures and shapes that we can see with our small telescopes, uh, whether it be Jupiter or Saturn, or if you've got a, a really fantastic telescope, perhaps on Neptune. And on these planets, again, the clouds uh, can be made of different materials. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn, these are primarily ammonia ices, ammonia sulfur compounds. And on Uranus and Neptune, further out uh, planets, uh, again, you have the appearance of methane ice. And at least in the case of Uranus, we now know that hydrogen sulfide is another form of ice clouds that form in the, the atmosphere uh, that we can detect with our astronomical instrumentation at home. So clouds are diverse here on our planet. And even though they're all made of water, and of course, when we look broader out in the solar system, 
clouds are even more diverse because they can be made out of different substances. And of course, the reason that we have different substances has everything to do with the temperatures of the atmospheres of these planets. Um, as we look at, for example, the giant solar planets, um, uh, these are uh, uh, pressure, sorry, temperature altitude measurements. So this is what the temperature of each of these giant planets looks like as you move up and out through the atmosphere. And this point at zero here is kind of at the cloud layer. It's kind of roughly where we see the surface of the atmosphere. Of course, there's no end to the atmosphere. It just continues out, but at some point it becomes transparent. So this can be considered kind of that transparent zone. And uh, as you go deeper into these planets, the temperature rises. Um, and at that case, you're intersecting different temperature regions where different substances condense out. So again, just going back to basic, you know, meteorology, clouds are just the condensation of species into liquid and solid condensates. But where these clouds form depends on what the temperature is at different layers in the atmosphere. So for example, if we look at Jupiter here, uh, the innermost of the giant planets and the most massive, uh, as you progress below the nominal cloud deck, or at least the what we call the photosphere, the point where the atmosphere becomes transparent, you intersect different kinds of clouds as you go deeper, ammonia, ammonia, ammonium hydrosulfide. And if you go deep enough, you would find the same kind of water clouds we have here on Earth. But they're so deep that they're actually invisible to us from observing from above, but they exist at those lower layers. And other planets like Saturn also have these same clouds, but at different depths because you have to go deeper to get to these higher temperatures. So when we get to these really thick atmospheres from giant planets, as opposed to the very thin atmosphere that we have for our Earth, we can start to have a variety of different cloud species because we're able to find these places where different uh, substances can condense out. So that's one important concept. The other thing I want to point out is that uh, you know this is you know, a case of kind of chemical equilibrium, right? Things just like naturally condense out in sort of a nice subtle state. But of course, atmospheres aren't very dynamic, right? They have bands and storms, jets and winds, and how those uh, uh, winds move the chemicals around through the atmosphere can give rise to all of the complexity we see in the cloud structures, not just here on Earth, but also on these giant planets. Now, these are all pretty cold species, right? We've talked about ices water ice, ammonia ice, methane ice. Uh, and that's because the, these outer planets are pretty cold. They're far away from the sun. You can imagine that you know, maybe you want to explore a place that has uh, hotter condensed substances. You know, if I consider, you can't really see this, but I consider the, my, the rock that's sitting here, right? That rock is a solid species. And if we think about how hard it is to melt a rock, well, could you have an atmosphere that's made out of rock clouds, right? Any condensate can form a cloud. So, what is sort of the limits of the hotter substances that we can have for clouds? Well, for that, we're gonna to need to go to hotter objects. And of course, in our solar system, we got one pretty hot object, that's the sun. Um, but the problem is the sun is too hot, right? The sun's surface is about uh, 6,000 degrees Kelvin. At those temperatures, none of the substances that we know about can condense out into liquid or solid form. In fact, the sun's atmosphere has very little in the way of molecules itself. All the molecules are actually shredded apart um, with the exception of the very cold, dark uh, sunspots, where you can get it just be just cool enough to form some molecules of, of carbon monoxide. But for the most part, the sun's atmosphere is just much too hot to form anything in the way of condensates. And so we don't talk about clouds on the sun. There are certainly plasma plumes and um, all these kind of different structures that happen because the magnetic structure of the sun. But those aren't the same traditional kinds of weather clouds that we talk about when we talk about planets. So it seems, at least in our solar system, we're kind of constrained to having systems that have very cold clouds and the sun, which has no clouds. And the question is, are there any systems out there that we can study that might be in between these two systems where we might have other cloud systems? And uh, the answer is no, so I'm gonna end my talk right there. Just kidding. <laughs> of course the answer is yes. Otherwise this would be a very boring talk. Uh, there are objects that are between these, and these are the brown dwarfs that I had mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Um, these are objects that really straddle the regime between giant planets like Jupiter and stars like the Sun, both in terms of mass and size, and importantly for this talk, in terms of their uh, temperatures and therefore the compositions of their atmospheres. And what we're going to find is that these brown dwarfs, because they span a pretty broad range of temperatures, can actually encompass the 
uh, sort of a range of properties where you can have the hottest clouds that we have in the universe, right? Again, thinking from the perspective of condensed species, uh, brown dwarfs actually host the hottest of these clouds that we see. So what I'm gonna kind of focus, break this talk down in is to first introduce brown dwarfs because maybe not every one of you have heard of what a brown dwarf is. Um, so I'll give a little bit of a background on what those objects are and, and why they're, they're interesting to study for other reasons. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we know that they have clouds, what is the evidence for clouds on these objects? And then how do we study these clouds? And, and what else do they tell us about the properties, the physical properties of these brown dwarfs that may be related to their formation or their evolution? So let's start with, what are these things? What are brown dwarfs? So let me go back to this picture that's comparing Jupiter and the sun. And um, this is the, these two objects here are, are shown, uh, their sizes are shown to scale. They're, th this is not the distance scale, of course. Jupiter is much further away from the sun than shown here. Um, but Jupiter and, set, and, and so our largest planet in the solar system, Jupiter, and our, our only star in the solar system, the sun, um, share a lot of things in common. Uh, they both have mostly hydrogen and helium atmospheres. Uh, they have large magnetospheres. The magnetic fields that surround these bodies are extremely extensive. They extend far beyond the sizes of the sun and the size of Jupiter. I mean, the sun's magnetosphere extends way out to the edges of our solar system. Uh, and Jupiter's magnetosphere uh, is something that's bigger than the full moon on the sky, if you could actually see it. So these are very large, uh, uh, strong magnetic fields around these objects. And both of these have orbiting bodies. So obviously, Jupiter is one of the orbiting bodies around the sun. But of course, many of you know that, the, that Jupiter itself has a whole system of uh, moons, uh, somewhere around the order of 70 moons that are orbiting around it. So to some level, you can almost think of Jupiter as kind of a scaled down version of the sun. Same stuff, smaller size, same number of already bodies, but mostly smaller things. But of course, there are very fundamental differences between these objects as well. You know, obviously the size is one. Jupiter is about 10 times smaller than the sun, about a thousand times less massive. Um, and of course, the temperatures are very, very different. The sun's surface is about 6,000 Kelvin, as I mentioned earlier where Jupiter is a paltry 125 degrees Kelvin, which is somewhere on the, the order of 100, uh, minus 150 degrees Celsius, very much below freezing, all right, very cold surface. And that's of course why it has these methane and ammonia clouds. But the fundamental distinction that uh, I'd say most astronomers think about when they compare giant planets to stars is what's happening in their interiors. The fact that the sun generates this heat, generates this light through the process of fusion, converting hydrogen into helium in the hot core, whereas giant planets like Jupiter simply aren't hot enough in their core to have these fusion reactions. So when we see Jupiter uh, through, you know, with our eyes, through, through a telescope, um, what we're really mostly looking at is the reflected light from the sun. Jupiter does emit its own radiation. We're going to see some images of that later. But that radiation is very, very weak and at very long wavelengths. Again, because it's because Jupiter is such a cold object. So Jupiter itself is not generating uh, new energy to you know, uh, produce its radiance. Uh, it's mostly getting all its energy from the sun. And some of the energy left over from its formation is radiating out. But there's a balance between what's coming in from the sun and what's radiating out. There's nothing coming from Jupiter itself. Whereas the sun and other stars are generating all that energy interiorly from the conversion of hydrogen into helium. So again, from an astronomer perspective, or at least from an astrophysicist perspective, if you want to say what's different between Jupiter and Sun, the main thing I would point to is that fusion or not fusion, right? These kind of key, this key process that allows stars to shine. Now, stars, of course, also come in a wide variety of different uh, properties. Um, I'm going to just change my share here so this stream's a little bit easier. So what I'm going to show you is a uh, small video that um, uh, was made by Jay Anderson, who's an astronomer at Space Telescope Science Institute, um, looking at Hubble Space Telescope data of this cluster of Omega Centauri. This is a massive old cluster of stars. Uh, this is, by the way, a great a small telescope deep sky object you can take a look at. Um, tens of thousands of stars in this cluster, all of them 13, uh, 12, 13 billion years old and uh, a wide variety in this diversity of stars in the system as well. 
So what you're seeing here in the color image is a small uh, uh, piece of the cluster kind of out here on the outskirts and showing all the different varieties of stars. And of course, immediately to our eye, we can see that there are stars of different colors, different brightnesses. Most of the stars in this picture are members of the Omega Sun cluster. Now, uh, Jay made this great uh, illustration to show how kind of one of the basic processes we do as astronomers to understand these differences is to essentially reorganize our data. So what this video is gonna do is gonna sort these stars based on their color and their brightness. So let's see what that looks like. So first we're shifting all the blue stars to the left side of the image and all the red stars to the right side of the image. So you have kind of a color gradient there. And now we're gonna shift all the bright stars to the top and all the faint stars to the bottom. And those of you who are astronomy aficionados know immediately what we're making here is a color magnitude diagram that's comparing the brightness of the stars to their colors. And um, you can see a very beautiful clear pattern shows up. This is our classical HR diagram, color magnitude diagram of a cluster that shows the main sequence of stars that make up most of the hydrogen burning stars in the system. And then the red giants and the blue giants that trace the evolution of stars as they run out of hydrogen and start to go through other stages of internal fusion uh, and expand and contract depending on that st those states. And eventually as these bright stars lose their atmospheres, they eventually become the white dwarfs that Professor Gainsky is gonna be talking about later on today. Now what's often left out of the discussion on these systems is these faint little dinky stars down here, right? There's quite a few of them, but they're really small and bright, at least very dim and red in this image. And those turn out to be in my picture, one of the best uh, kinds of stars. So here's another illustration of the diversity of stars, a little bit more artistic one, showing the different classes of hydrogen burning stars that we see in our, in our uh, universe. Um, going from the very hottest and brightest here on the right, the O stars, to stars like the sun, uh, G dwarfs, to these very lowest mass stars that are out there. These are the M dwarfs and you can see, you know, our completely bonkers sequence of letters to explain spectral, spectral types. Um, maybe you may have had an opportunity to come up with your own uh, accurate or, or mnemonic to come up remember what these letter sequences are. Um, but you know, again, most folks, particularly when they're studying planetary systems or they're studying uh, very distant star systems, will focus on these brightest and most massive of stars because you can see them, right? They're so luminous, so bright that we can see them at very large distances, including out at the uh, omega sun globular cluster. But it turns out that these little stars down here are the most numerous stars in our galaxy. About 70% of all stars in the galaxy are these tiny little M dwarfs. But we don't actually see any M dwarfs with our naked eye. They are so faint that we need to have telescopes to even see the nearest of these M dwarfs. And you know, the other thing a pattern I'll point out, of course, is that this is a sequence in color and luminosity, but also with the sequence in mass and size. These O-type stars are among the most massive stars in, that are, are fusing hydrogen, about 40 times as massive as the sun, um, and about 10 times larger than the sun, whereas you get down to these very low mass stars, but yeah, they're on the other end of the spectrum, 10 times smaller, 10 times less massive than stars like the sun. Now, to figure out where the size distribution comes from, it's important to remember where the stars come from themselves. So if we take a, a deep picture at some of the dark uh, uh, clouds and dark, you know, dark regions in our galactic plane, we can start to find some of the star forming regions the star forming clouds. Um, this is one of these, this is the Eagle Nebula. Um, those of you who are uh, Hubble Space Telescope aficionados will remember the pillars of creation. This is one of the pillars of creation. So this is a, a smaller subset of that uh, classic image. Um, and these are the regions that are forming clouds and these kind of are forming stars. And these kind of structures are extremely large, about 10 light years across uh, and very fragmented because what's happening in all these little knobs uh, on the edges of these uh, threads of, of dust and gas is the contraction, gravitational contraction of pre-stellar cores, things that are eventually gonna form stars of all different kinds of sizes and masses. And what sizes, what masses they come out of uh, kind of depends on just the distribution of how these things break apart. But the sizes are very tightly uh, determined by the masses of the stars themselves. So as a very advanced illustration of this, which I've managed to make in my own PowerPoint demonstration, 
Um, if we take a very simple physics model of a collapsing star, which in most cases is just a sphere, we start with a sphere of that material that's maybe a tenth of a light year across. As that sphere contracts in, in fact, actually as it radiates, um, if it's able to overcome the thermal pressure inside that cloud, it will start to collapse. And as it collapses, it's transforming some of that gravitational energy into thermal energy, right? Much like if I dropped my keys, as it hits the ground, all of that gravitational potential energy goes into the sound that it makes when it hits the, hits the ground, right? So in this case, the sound is actually heat and it's heating up the interior of the star. About half of it gets radiated off and half of it goes into making the star uh, hotter. And this will continue uh, until the interior of the star gets hot enough to start those fusion reactions. And uh, you need about a million Kelvin uh, degree, uh, degrees of temperature to get those uh, hydrogen to helium nuclear reactions starting. And once that does, that provides now a new source of energy to provide the thermal pressure to hold the star up. So the fusion reactions not only provide the, the light and the heat that we see from the surface of the sun, but they also provide the pressure to hold the star uh, in place. And so that's why a star like the sun, once it gets to this stable uh, uh, point where it's balancing the fusion reactions in its core and the radiation from its surface, stays roughly the same size for billions of years. It's what we call an thermodynamic and hydrostatic equilibrium. It's staying the same temperature and it's staying roughly the same size. Now for a star like the sun, it had to shrink down to a sun diameter in order to get to those temperatures and find this balance point. But if you start with less mass, uh, maybe a star that's only a tenth of a mass of a star, you have less ability to extract gravitational potential energy. So you have to shrink the star even further down. And so a star that's maybe a tenth of the solar mass is going to have to shrink down to about a tenth of the size of the sun before there's enough gravitational energy put in to heat up the core and start those nuclear reactions. So, and in fact, this is what we measure when we measure very accurately the masses and radii of stars. This is a study uh, by a colleague, uh, Tab uh, uh, Tabitha Boyajian. You may know that name from Bio Boyajian star, the, the alien megastructure star, uh, but much of her work has been in making fundamental measurements of stars, including their masses and radii. Uh, you can actually measure directly the radii of stars using a technique called interferometry. And she's been able to do this for a sample of stars spanning uh, a solar mass all the way down to about a tenth of solar mass. And you can see this beautiful linear relationship between the mass of the star and how big it is. And again, all of that ultimately comes from the fact that these stars always have to shrink down to the point where they start nuclear reactions. That's when you get a nice stable star and lower mass stars have to do more shrinking than higher mass stars. All right. So this is you know, a classic relationship. We, knew, we can measure this, we can see this out in space. Um, anytime an astronomer draws a line on a, on a diagram, um, the question is how far does that line actually apply, right? Can I really take this line down to the zero point, right? Or another way to put this is how small can a star actually be? If a solar mass star can shrink down to a solar radius and a 10th of a solar mass star shrinks down to a 10th of a solar radius, can you make a hundredth of a solar mass star that shrinks down to a hundredth of a solar radius, which would be about the size of the Earth, which is, by the way, the size of the objects that uh, Dr. Nancy is going to be talking about later, although they are very different from these hydrogen burning stars. Well, it turns out this is a question that was being asked back in the 1960s, and it turns out that the, the, this M dwarf range down to a tenth of solar mass is pretty close to the limit as how small we can make stars, and it has to do with another physical concept, and that's called electron degeneracy. Now, you may be familiar with other forms of degeneracy. One of my favorite forms is subway degeneracy uh, and, and the corresponding subway degeneracy pressure. Uh, the idea that you can't pack in enough people into the subway, uh, at some point, uh, you just there's just no more room and you, know, you have to have uh, some pressure to push in the rest of the people. This is a picture from uh, Tokyo subway. Um, this is actually not exactly the right concept because this is just people kind of getting packed into the space. Uh, electrons are a little bit different because they're quantum mechanical objects. And so instead of thinking of as kind of packing little spheres of electrons all together, we have to also take in consideration their wave properties. So a, a better analogy uh, that came, um, uh, that I found on the Harvard Chandler X-ray uh, Center's uh, website, uh, which is interested in, in degeneracy for, for more massive objects. Um, I like to think of this as the, the electron degeneracy parking issue. So if you, you know, 
if you remember parking a year ago, um, you know, if you're in a, in a mall or something like that, and, and, you know, there's plenty of spaces for parking your car, you know, it's, you know, it's not, it's not very high pressure. You can kind of park wherever you want. You, know, you can take your time, no problem. Um, but if there's not a lot of spaces available, right, you start to get these very aggressive drivers who are trying to get to that spot and, and you know, kind of stalking around and making sure people, you know, move. Um, you know, there's another kind of energy aspect to that parking uh, idea. Um, and that's kind of, that's, you know, from an analogy perspective, that's something you can think about for electrons. It's not just that we can't pack them all in the same place, but we also have to be mindful that we can't pack them into the same energy. Uh, when we talk about a state of electron, it's not just where it physically is, but also its energy state. And if we have a really dense gas where we've got lots and lots of electrons just floating around, uh, eventually they start to fill in not just all the physical spaces, but also the, all the energy spaces, leaving other electrons, which have high energies, unable to cool off to those lower energy states. Essentially, all of the space is filled, both from physical space and energy space, and you're left with these very energetic electrons that no matter what they can do, they can't slow down or cool off because there's nowhere to slow down or cool off to. And it's those energetic electrons that provide a new form of pressure because they're bouncing all around. And that's called degeneracy pressure. So it's different from thermal pressure, which is just you know the random motion because of the heat. You could have an object that has zero temperature and still have pressure from these energetic electrons. And this is exactly what's happening both in the interiors of brown dwarfs and as it turns out in the interiors of white dwarfs to keep them at a certain size. So you're going to see that again a little bit later. So in any case, we have, and so this again, this was studied back in the 1960s and uh, one of the papers that looked into this by Shiv Kumar, who's a professor at University of Virginia, um, looked at just stars of different masses. And so what you're seeing here is a plot from his paper showing the core temperature in log units. So this is 10 to the 5.7, 10 to the 6.5, millions of degrees Kelvin. And the core density, and this is in units of grams per cubic centimeter, because for some reason astronomers like to use grams for, for mass units. Um, and uh, the tracks here are showing how these stars evolve as they cool off. And so they're going off in this direction. They're, they're shrinking down, so they're getting higher density. And that energy is going into heating up the core, so they're going up this way. And this line is showing the point where electron energy becomes an important part of the pressure um, uh, source. What happens is as the tracks move across this line, they no longer contract, or at least they don't contract very fast. And therefore, they're not heating up at the same rate as they were before. And they essentially just stop in terms of their heating, right? They kind of plateau out. They get to a maximum temperature and they don't go any further. And if it turns out that maximum temperature is less than about 3 million degrees Kelvin, then these objects are never going to get hot enough to have enough fusion to sustain their, their radiation. They've essentially stalled out before they've had a chance to kick in these nuclear reactions. And we call these objects brown dwarfs because they're different from stars in the fact that they don't fuse hydrogen. They're just not hot enough to do so. And uh, Shiv is, uh, and other people have computed that the uh, limit for that is about seven hundredths or seven percent of a solar mass. So just below that M dwarf mass limit, this is, a, this is the smallest a star can be and still be fusing hydrogen. Anything below this, it's going to be an object that is not fusing hydrogen at all. So these are very different objects, right? The sun is something that's supported by thermal pressure and it's in thermal balance because it's generating energy from fusion as it radiates away. Brown dwarfs are things that are supported by degeneracy pressure and they are still radiating energy away, which means that they over time cool off. And this is what this looks like. This is a, um, another plot showing different models for stars and brown dwarfs and even lower mass things, showing the effective temperature as a function of age and this is measured in billions of years, as the giga year shows there. And stars, uh, even low mass stars, eventually will get to a plateau in their temperature because they're balancing the radiation, they're, the energy they're creating from fusion and the radiation they're losing away. Whereas brown dwarfs just continue to cool off over time. And from this perspective, they are fundamentally different from stars. Um, now I should say there's another designation here called planets, which are objects that don't fuse anything. Brown dwarfs can fuse some deuterium uh, early on in their lifetimes. Uh, planets don't fuse anything. Planets is kind of a working word, I would say. It's, it's actually the IAU definition, but 
there's many people that argue whether you can call a thing a planet that may, ha may have formed just on its own, like a star. Um, this is a terminology uh, issue that's come up because of the discovery of these objects. Um, it's just important to keep in mind that these are just, these are objects that are just kind of failed stars. They didn't get a chance to accumulate enough mass and therefore enough temperature at its core to start the fusion reactions that allow stars to fuse and, and stay steady bright over long periods of time. Now, because they cool off, that means that they can become both very cold and very faint to the point where they are actually invisible. So this is gonna be uh, our, our first acuity test of the day. Um, the question is, uh, can you find the brown dwarf in these images? So I'm gonna show you two images, a visible light image and an infrared image. And the infrared, uh, if you remember your, your physics is going to measure sources that are cooler because they emit more of the radiation at longer wavelengths than shorter wavelengths. And these images are reversed uh, shown. So you can see kind of the stars pop out a little bit better than the, in the bright uh, white field. So here is a visible light image. Here's the same field in the infrared. And uh, I, I invite you, if you're in the chat, if you have found the brown dwarf, go ahead and don't tell us where it is. It's hard to tell you where it is in the chat, but you know, shout out if you're, if you're able to find it. And I will go back to the visible light image and the infrared image. Anybody see it? All right, visible light image, infrared image. Want to go back and forth a little bit faster. And I'll say, this is something I did as a graduate student for years, trying to find brown dwarfs. And what you're looking for is something that shows up in the infrared image, but not the visible light image. Uh, I'm not seeing anyone see it in the chat window. So I will just tell you that it's right there, right? So, Sometimes the universe just puts a big circle around the thing you're looking for. Again, here's the infrared image and here's the visible light image. This is an invisible star, right? A star that doesn't show up in our regular visible bands. So brown dwarfs were predicted to exist back in the 1960s, but because we didn't have the technology to image the sky in the infrared at sufficient sensitivity, they were essentially invisible to our eyes, just like the M dwarfs are invisible to our naked eyes. And we needed telescopes to find those these brown dwarfs are invisible, invisible wavelength overall, and it required an advancement in technology, infrared detectors, to actually find these systems in the infrared. And so the discoveries were made mostly in 1990s. Uh, this is a, a sort of couple of these objects that were found. This is a companion to a nearby low mass star called Gliese 229b. Um, this is just a uh, cool object found in the young cluster um, that has uh, not only the low temperatures we expect for brown dwarfs, but also importantly, and it's a little hard to see in this plot, but there is an absorption feature from an element called lithium. Lithium is a, a, an element that gets destroyed in the cores of these stars. And so when we look at you know, young stars, like you know, the solar mass like young stars, we don't tend to see lithium in their atmospheres. But when we start to see lithium, we know that these, the cores are too cold to fuse hydrogen because it would have also fused the lithium. So this is known as the lithium test to figure out if you have a brown dwarf. This is a direct measure of what's happening in the interior of the star. Uh, so 1990s uh, sort of provided the first uh, evidence of these objects. Uh, today, we know there are tens of thousands of these things. I mean, we, we know of tens of thousands. There are a lot more of these out in the galaxy. Um, we're able to now organize these into different spectral classes. So what we're showing here is the uh, spectra. So taking light, spreading out as a function of wavelength. Uh, across the infrared, so one to about seven or eight microns over here. And um, these different lines just show examples of the different spectral classes that we now know for brown dwarfs, uh, with the exception of Y dwarfs, they don't have that in there. Um, but these, you know, remember M dwarfs are the lowest mass stars, and now these are two, three new classes, L, T, and Y, to continue the completely non-ordered random sequencing of letters. Um, but these different types uh, categorize star, uh, these cool objects that have different uh, patterns in their spectra. So um, M dwarfs are very well known for their titanium oxide bands here in the optical, but they also have water vapor absorption in their atmospheres uh, and carbon monoxide. Uh, the L dwarfs lose this titanium oxide and get these very strong uh, atomic features. And then we get to the T dwarfs, which was the subject of my own graduate thesis. Um, these objects have very strong methane absorption features. Again, this is methane gas we're talking about, not, not the clouds yet. Um, and those methane features eat out a lot of the spectra and actually make the spectrum look a lot like the spectrum of Jupiter down here. And keep, again, keep in mind that a lot of this is reflected light, 
but we still see the absorption features from the chemicals in its atmosphere. Um, and so these objects really do bridge the range of you know, bodies that go from low mass stars all the way down to a giant planet like Jupiter. And indeed, one of the coldest brown dwarfs we now know about is this object called WISE 0855. This is an example of a Y dwarf, and it is the coldest brown dwarf we know so far. Its surface temperature we've estimated to be about minus 20 degrees Celsius. That is below freezing. Uh, so this is a star that is frozen, which is really still boggles my mind even to this day. Um, and this is a very nearby star. It's only about two parsecs or about, uh, about eight light years away from the sun. And in fact, what we're finding is a lot of these brown dwarfs do reside pretty close to the sun. And so that means that they're very common in the galaxy. And again, we're only able to find them now because of the advances in technology, particularly out in infrared imaging. So this is a nice schematic of, of some of our nearest neighbors, some of which we've known for some time. Of course, Alpha Centauri is something you can see with your naked eye, but uh, Proxima Centauri, our nearest star, was only discovered in the 19 teens, along with Barnard's star. Um, but in the last uh, few years, the last 10 years or so, we've discovered several other systems that are at comparable distances. There's WISE 0855. This is a binary star system called Lumen 16 or WISE 1049. And then this binary system here looks threateningly close to the sun, but actually this is a projection of where it existed about 70,000 years ago. Based on its current motion away from us, we believe it passed within about 50,000 light years of the, uh, sorry, 50,000 astronomical units, so 50,000 times distance between the sun and the earth um, back about 70,000 years ago. Amazingly, we still would not have seen it with our naked eye because it was so faint, right? So these are newly found objects that have been there, but uh, we've only now gotten the technology to detect them. All right, so now I'm gonna transition, uh, <laughs> falling behind a little bit. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the weather and hopefully we can get through uh, some key uh, aspects of this. Um, Remember this plot I showed about the different kinds of ices that form, or different kinds of clouds that form in the atmosphere of these objects. Uh, we can now ask the same question, do, would we see other kinds of species if we had hotter atmospheres? And again, the contention here is that these brown dwarfs have kind of atmospheres that might bridge between stars and, and giant planets and be sensitive to these different kinds of clouds. Now, it's important to remember again that different kinds of substances can have different kinds of temperatures for vaporization when they turn into a gas. And we're actually looking at the reverse process. If we have a gas in our atmosphere, what is the temperature where things can condense out? It's the same kind of number. Um, and so, you know, again, on Earth, we focus mostly on water, which vaporizes about 100 degrees Celsius, um, which means there's plenty of space for liquid and solid water to exist because fortunately our, our atmosphere is not 100 degrees Celsius. That would be terrible. Um, but, uh, you know, if we get up to more uh, hard to melt substances or refractory substances, like rocks and iron, you need to get to very high temperatures. And of course, anyone who works in the steel industry knows this to be true. Um, but it turns out, you know, this is if you're open to very high temperatures for kinds of objects, this is just a matter of cranking up the heat. So uh, there's lots of different substances that can condense out into liquid and solid formats, depending on what temperature you're at. And this is kind of just a, a schematic of, this kind of a spaghetti plot of all different kinds of chemicals. But the thing to read off here is, um, at different temperatures, so this is low to high, you can get ammonia, water, uh, you can get salt to start to evaporate, right? Sodium chloride, calcium, uh, potassium chloride. Um, you start to get some rocks and metals out here at about 1500 degrees Kelvin. Uh, and then as you get down to 2000, 2500 Kelvin, that's when you start to get the hardest to melt uh, substances. Um, and uh, actually trivia question, and, and again, please use the chat if you know, What's the highest temperature substance, either temperature or substance, to melt? Anybody know? Or to vaporize, excuse me. Didn't think there would be a quiz today, did you? All right, I'm not seeing any answers on the chat. Oh, so, okay, so thanks, Lauren, yeah. Diamond is uh, actually number three. Pretty good. All right, I'll leave you to discover that. I won't answer every question, but I'll leave that discover for you to discover that on your own. Uh, tungsten, oh, so it's in QA. Okay, so tungsten is number four. 
And of course, tungsten is a good one because that's you know we that's what we put, that's why Edison put that in the light bulbs because it wouldn't melt as you strung uh, you know electricity through it at high resistance. Um, I'll let you discover it. We'll we'll answer that a little bit in the Q and A. Anyways, these temp those temperatures are around four thousand degrees Celsius, um, so actually quite off the chart here. But they're also very rare substances, so they don't play much of a role in cloud formation in these objects. These more common rocks and metals are the things that we're mostly interested in. Now, how do we know could this happen? So this is that's just theory, right? Chemical theory. How do we know it actually happens? Well, what we can do is make some observations and see how these brown dwarfs change as they vary in temperature. Uh, and so uh, remember, I point out that the M dwarfs have these strong bands of titanium and vanadium oxide. These are kind of the classic bands that define the M dwarfs. And as we discovered cooler objects, what we found is that those bands, which are highlighted in yellow here, disappear. So for example, you follow this line down, you see this nice sort of absorption dip here that gets weaker and then eventually is totally gone and it's replaced by some other absorption features that were just buried underneath that, that pattern. Same thing with some of the bands over here that disappear pretty quickly. Those gases disappear because they condense out into other species. And, and in particular, they condense out into rocks, things like encetite, perovskite that contain titanium. Um, vanadium oxide itself just condenses into its own uh, uh, solid species. And so we're losing the gas absorption because they're forming solid substances. And that's a key sign of condensation. The other thing we can do is we can see the condensates themselves, the absorption they effect they have in the atmosphere when we go out to longer infrared wavelengths. Um, and so this is another set of spectra of different brown dwarfs. And you see this very shallow dip here. That shallow dip is in the same place that we see absorption from silicates in comet, uh, comet spectra. And so the coincidence of those two features suggests that not only are we seeing the things that make the condensates disappear, we see the condensates themselves appear as absorption features in the spectra. Now, of course, clouds can take on all kinds of different forms, as I mentioned before, and there's a lot of different processes associated with clouds, how they're extended, right? Whether they're fine little you know, cloud layers or fogs, whether you have rain out, these are all in ingredients to go into going from the fact that we have condensation to do we actually have clouds? How do we actually organize those condensates in the clouds? And this is still an area of active research because it involves lots of complications in the atmospheric uh, dynamics. Um, this is just a couple of plots showing uh, some of the processes that are involved in studying clouds when you have to think about how uh, the, you know, the clouds, and the particles, the condensates actually form, how they start to grow in size. As they get too big, they may start to fall out. And then as they fall down, they evaporate and you start the cycle over again. So we think there's lots of cycles that are going on to kind of sustain these condensates in different layers in the atmosphere. And I, the other thing is, you know, how vertical extent these clouds are, of course, in our own atmosphere, that can depend on all kinds of atmospheric dynamics. And we think that's the same case in these atmospheres that you could have brown dwarfs that have very thick and, and thin clouds, or you could have brown dwarfs that have uh, very light and fluffy clouds. All of this is kind of a new parameter to describe these atmospheres that, again, touch on the actual dynamics that are happening inside those atmospheres. And because we're now talking about multiple species, that means that we can have many layers of clouds of different, different times. So just like Jupiter and Saturn, as we go uh, deeper, so we go from the uh, top of the atmosphere down to deeper layers, we might run into these kind of rock clouds and then you know, even deeper below, uh, different kinds of rock clouds with so different layers of, of clouds, just like you have different layers of clouds in Jupiter and Saturn. But as you get to even cooler temperatures, just the number of substances that can condense out results in an amazing diversity of different kinds of clouds, right? So, and the coolest temperatures here, we think we could have the same kind of clouds we see in Jupiter and Saturn, as well as clouds of salts, as well as clouds of sulfides, as well as clouds of rocks. So really much more complicated structure than we see in the giant planets. And of course, obviously much more complicated than the sun because there are no clouds in those objects. Now, of course, to study that, so that's just kind of, a, again, a picture of, of what we expect to see in these atmospheres. How do we actually know this? Well, ideally, we would love to have a picture uh, like we have of Jupiter. This is Jupiter at, at, at uh, 10 microns, uh, showing uh, the sort of hot light that's coming between the cloud layers. So the dark bands are the clouds, and the bright layers are the sort of deep infrared radiation coming between the gaps in the clouds. That's what we would love to see. What we, of course, see is just this little field with that little spot, right? So how do we infer a picture like the upper left based on the data we have in the lower right? 
Well, one way you can do this is we can change spatial uh, dimension with time dimension. So this is a, 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 a amateur's uh, sort of video of Jupiter taken through their own telescope. This is about three hours of data. Jupiter rotates once every about uh, 10 or 11 hours. Um, and so you can see, you know, the clouds kind of rotate around. And, you know, if you were to integrate this light, you would find, of course, as the red spot came in, that the brightness of Jupiter as a whole would change as different structures come into view. This is the same idea when we talk about sunspots changing the light curve of stars. It's those dark spots coming in that change the total amount of light. So we can, in principle, do the same thing with planets like Jupiter. Um, and in fact, that's what we have seen. So uh, there's been a number of studies going back about a decade now that have focused on staring at brown dwarfs over long periods of time to see if we can see those same kind of variations that we might infer from a planet like Jupiter. And indeed, we have seen them, and in fact, quite abundant. So this is one example of one of these light curves. These are uh, three, four different days and different wavelength bands, but you can see this kind of characteristic sinusoidal shape that forms, uh, and presumably because there's some kind of spot or storm on the brown dwarf that's rotating in and out of view. And again, this is not a star spot as a magnetic spot. This is a storm spot that would come from the weather dynamics on these brown dwarfs. These objects are actually too cool to have those kind of star spots. Uh, so we think this is due to weather. Now, we actually find that this is very common. Uh, there's been now a number of studies to look at this statistically. And what they found is whether you're talking about L dwarfs or T dwarfs or even some of these new Y dwarfs, there seems to be quite a lot of variability amongst all of these systems. Um, in the L dwarfs in particular, we find something like two thirds of them are variable. That fraction drops as we go to cooler objects, but we think that drops primarily because we're just not sensitive enough to those variations. So it's in principle, it's possible that all of these brown dwarfs have some kind of structure on their atmospheres that give rise to variability. It's just a limit of how sensitive we are to those variabilities. Um, let's skip that. And we even know that the coldest uh, brown dwarf that I mentioned earlier, Y0855, is variable. And that's actually important because uh, we think that this object is cool enough because it's minus 20 degrees Celsius uh, at, its, uh, at its atmosphere, cool enough to have water clouds in its atmosphere. So we might actually be seeing the same kind of you know, cloud-based weather that we see here on Earth on this brown, very distant brown dwarf. Very amazing to have that connection happening. So again, the evidence that we that there are clouds in these objects comes from this variability. Now, I know many of you are interested in light curves. I can say there's lots of variety of light curves for these objects. Some of these objects have very stable sinusoidal light curves that don't change over two years. Some have uh, kind of uh, crazy light curves that vary quite considerably. Some have very long light curves. Some have very short light curves. Um, here's a source. Uh, this is actually one of the objects we talked about earlier that has almost a chaotic light curve. It changes almost every night. Um, and it's those chaotic ones that we actually find the most interesting because um, they're telling us something about more than just a spot uh, or a storm on the brown dwarf. It's telling us that there's a lot more structure and potentially structure that looks more like a giant planet. So this is a study that my colleague, uh, Daniel Apai at University of Arizona uh, produced a few years ago, uh, looking at one of these complex light curves. Uh, and that's the blue and red points that have been measured. And then the black line is a model that was generated by modeling the brown dwarf, not just a spot going around, but with a series of different jets and bands that vary uh, in their rotation rate, depending on where they are in latitude. Now, those of you who are planetary aficionados know that that's actually what happens on planets like Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, the different layers uh, and bands, Jupiter and Saturn, are actually moving at different speeds. And so you can have kind of coincidences as one band catches up with another one and overlaps with it that can create these kind of complex light curves. And in fact, the kind of numerical model that we've come up for this particular brown dwarf looks a lot like the infrared picture we have of Neptune with these kind of bands with different features within them, All right? Obviously it's not as detailed because this is just a model, but we're seeing the similar kinds of structures, uh, uh, band cloud structures uh, on these objects to explain these complex light curves as we already see directly with our solar planets. Now, another thing we can do is something called Doppler imaging. And this is something, again, it's done in, in solar science, looking at the, uh, how these magnetic spots vary over time. Um, not only do they block out the light, but they also block out light as a function of wavelength. Because if you have a rotating object, this side of the star is moving at us, so it's blue shifted. 
and this side of the star is moving away from us, so it's red shifted. And so if you have a spot that just covers part of the surface, it's going to only take light away from, in this case, the blue side, and in this case, oops, this case, the red side. So that's going to change the shape of the absorption lines that we see in the spectrum. So this is a technique that we apply for stars, and now we've started to apply it for brown dwarfs as well. Um, and in fact, uh, a few years ago, one of the most uh, spectacular results was the discovery that they've applied this to one of our rapidly rotating brown dwarfs and actually produced this uh, fairly detailed map of what its cloud structures look like. Now, this again is, we have to be careful, this, is, this may not be exactly what the, the clouds look like on this object. This is an inference from uh, sort of disentangling this information in, this, in the spectral regime, regime. But the important thing is it does tell us that there's a lot more complexity than just a uniform cloud like we see on Titan or Venus that there may be actually be a lot of structures here that again depend on the atmospheric dynamics of the brown dwarf. Now we can also go deeper than this. So that's a 2D picture of the clouds on the surface, but we can also look three-dimensionally, look deeper into the atmosphere. And that's because at different wavelengths, we're actually seeing different layers in the atmospheres of these objects that have clouds and absorbing features. Now we already know this from the solar planets, I'd shown earlier an infrared picture of Jupiter. And here's, a, here's another one here showing, again, at these five micron region, these really bright uh, uh, kind of lines and, and spots here are actually gaps in the clouds themselves. We're seeing deeper into the atmosphere where it's hotter, and therefore we're getting a lot more light, whereas the clouds kind of cover up that light and you get these dark bands. Same thing happens in Saturn. So if we image a planet or a star, or at least a brown dwarf at different wavelengths, we can actually get a picture of what it looks like at different layers vertically into the atmosphere. And that's been done. Uh, people have been, been looking at not just photometric variability, but spectral variability, monitoring the spectrum of these objects over time. And from that, they've been able to infer some details about what the vertical structure of the clouds are. So this is a result from uh, colleagues at University of Arizona uh, as well, uh, showing the amplitude of variability as a function of wavelength for two L dwarfs and two T dwarfs. And you can see that there's, it's kind of flat or at least a little bit sloping for the L dwarfs. And that tells us that the clouds are pretty close to the surface. So they're all, they're varying all of the light kind of uniformly. Whereas for the T dwarfs, there's a strong decrease in the amplitude of variability in the region where water gas absorbs, which means that the clouds are probably deep under this water gas layer. And so when you're in the band where water gas absorbs the most, you don't see the cloud variability. But if you're outside that band, you can look deep enough and see that variability. So this is one of the techniques to kind of get both a vertical structure of the, of the system as well as the horizontal. So variations in wavelength tell us something about the vertical structure. And if we monitor those different wavelengths, we also find that the phase of variability is actually different. And that's actually even more complicated. It tells us that the layers are not moving all together, but perhaps are moving at slightly different rates and are therefore we're probing a vertical velocity to a structure in the atmosphere in addition to kind of these cloud layers. So there's a lot of depth that we're getting out of the, the kind of cloud depths, even though we only have a point of light by using time and spectral uh, information together. And one of the things we've learned is that brown dwarfs are very rapid rotators. This is a video made by NASA JPL of a recent discovery. Uh, this is meant to be in uh, kind of scaled time. So uh, the brown dwarf doesn't actually rotate this fast, but we're going to see it's compared to Jupiter. Um, it moves much, much more fast than, than Jupiter. So remember, Jupiter takes about 10 hours to go around. We're finding that many of these brown dwarfs take an hour to go around, right? Their day is an hour long. And that has uh, impacts on their uh, structure, their oblateness. Um, and it also tells us something about how they evolve with time. Most stars slow down in their rotation over time. These objects seem to stay very fast over long periods of time. Now, one last thing I want to point to is, is one of the questions we're also asking is how these clouds evolve with temperature, right? So I showed that, you know, the clouds can reside at different depths at a given temperature. But remember, brown dwarfs are objects that cool over time. So as they cool, how do their clouds evolve with that cooling? Do they just sink together with the, with the atmosphere or do they undergo any kind of changes? And in fact, it was very early on, we recognized that the L dwarfs were predominantly kind of cloudy objects. They matched cloudy predictions uh, for their photometry and spectra. But the T dwarfs like Lisa 229b, that first one was discovered in 1996, clearly did not match that and had to be something that was relatively cloud free, at least in the photosphere. And so early on, there was this question about how did you go from here, 
all the way over to here, cloudy to not cloudy uh, in this sort of evolving sequence of brown dwarfs. You know, was this just a weird object or was there something that's actually happening to these objects as they evolve? And one of the pieces of evidence that this is not a standard uh, evolution um, is we started to find binaries that had both L dwarf and T dwarf components. And surprisingly, uh, which one was brighter depended on what wavelength you looked at. Now, those of you who know your binaries know that when we, we label them A or B, we often will choose A to be the brighter object. But what happens when, say, the one component is brighter at one wavelength and the other component is brighter at the other wavelength? Which one's A and which one's B? Um, this, is a, this is a problem, right? Because it's not something we anticipate in terms of how these uh, objects evolve. We expect all things as they cool off to just get fainter. But it turns out because of the cloud effects, and in fact, what we think is happening is the clouds are disappearing very quickly. Um, the T dwarfs in these cases are actually brightening because we're suddenly removing the opacity from those clouds. It's like we suddenly cleared the clouds away and the sun is coming in, except it's in the other direction, the light's coming out. Um, and this is actually something that appears to be just a normal part of the process of evolution. As we started measuring the absolute brightnesses of these objects at this wavelength, we found that they were seen to getting brighter consistently across this transition, which suggests that all of these brown dwarfs lose their clouds very suddenly. I see Lauren is coming on, probably to tell me I got to wrap up. <laughs> um, shortly, yeah. we can give you yeah. about five more minutes. Okay, that's no problem. Right. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so what we, we think now is that the, the clouds are not just you know, structurally dynamic, but they're actually dynamic in the evolution as brown dwarfs cool over time. In fact, we've pointed to a period when these objects get to about 1200 degrees Kelvin, that the clouds, and again, these are clouds of rock and iron, suddenly rain out of the atmospheres, right? And a, and a quite quick process, and quick being you know, millions of years, so it's not that quick, but um, and a process that gets rid of them faster than the time scale for the brown dwarf to cool off. Um, and so we think that this is part of the evolutionary process of, of, of clouds in these objects, but there's something that kind of drives the destruction or breakup of these clouds at this given temperature and changes the entire appearance of these objects and gives rise to these new spectral types. Now, the question, of course, is what is the physical mechanism? What's causing that to happen, right? It'd be something like the clouds that are covering the sky right now, all of a sudden cleared out in a sudden rain pour. Something has to make that happen. And um, one of the things that we think is happening, uh, this is some work by some colleagues in Europe, uh, uh, Pascal Tremblin, uh, think that uh, there's a particular chemical transition that has nothing to do with clouds, but actually has to do with carbon monoxide and methane. Uh, now, remember that T dwarfs are objects that have methane absorption in atmospheres. That methane, the carbon and methane comes from the conversion of carbon monoxide plus hydrogen into methane plus water. Um, and those of you who remember your, your, your chemistry, uh, if, you know, the left side of this uh, equation has four molecules, the right side has two which means that uh, the mean molecular weight or the how much mass is contained in each molecule is actually going up, right? Because you're taking the same amount of mass and putting it into fewer molecules. This gives rise to something known as a thermal haline instability. Uh, thermo temperature haline is salt or really composition. And this is when you have a, a, a heavy substance on top of a light substance. They'll, the heavy substance of course wants to move down. And in certain kind of conditions of the fluid, which is, it turns out brown dwarfs satisfy, you can get what's called a, a, a fingering instability where these things kind of drip down into these little fingers of, of dense uh, material. Um, it turns out that that's a very efficient way to get rid of the clouds because you're actually mixing the atmosphere with an instability and that will disrupt that convection gravitational settling process they showed earlier. Enough that that could drive the disruption of these clouds. And indeed, Pascal has been able to uh, reproduce this brightening of objects at this LT transition simply by changing how much mixing is happening because of this mix of fingering instability. It doesn't change the temperature, doesn't change anything else, but can reproduce this very well. So we think we're seeing uh, now a new kind of fluid process in these objects um, that's happening at this transition. And, you know, just of interest to us, thermal haline instability is actually something that drives the circulation of the oceans on the earth. Um, as the hot water evaporates, uh, it leaves behind a denser salty water that then sinks down. That's part of the driving mechanism to get the currents to flow around and why those of you in England are experiencing much warmer temperatures than you would if you were, for example, over in Norway. So uh, 
this is, you know, that part of the physics that happens in our life around us. And we're seeing that these kind of processes also happen in these brown dwarfs. Uh, now, okay, I'm going to skip this because I have a little time, but I'll just say we are seeing some evidence of clouds and hot Jupiters as well. Um, and I'll just conclude that, you know, kind of the, the take home message I'd like you to take is that um, by using these techniques of time variability, spectral variability, we're able to get a pretty complex picture of what the atmospheres, or at least the cloud uh, uh, properties of these objects are. And we're finding that they're quite complicated. They show a lot of the same features that we see in giant planets in terms of jets and bands, um, but also very large structures that we don't see. Uh, Jupiter's large red spot uh, is actually relatively small compared to the surface of Jupiter. And we're starting to see evidence that these brown dwarfs have much larger storm systems, probably driven by their very fast rotation periods. And these, of course, are connected to all kinds of dynamical processes that tell us how brown dwarfs work, how the energy is distributed, and of course, how they evolve over time. And some of these may also be present in hot exoplanet atmospheres. Now, I'll leave you with you know, the fact that this is, so this is all, a lot of this work has been based on very painstaking work done from the ground. Um, when we're studying objects that vary over time scales of hours, that means you got to sit there for hours and collect the data. Um, you know, and we have to deal with clouds in our atmosphere, protecting us from the clouds in these other atmospheres. Um, but we're going to have some really great data sets coming uh, to us very soon um, through a few uh, large projects that are, 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 you know, very soon to happen. I mean, these things are happening in the next few years. James Webb should be launched uh, in the next, uh, in this year, and hopefully start operations next year. That's going to allow us to do very detailed spectral monitoring of these brown dwarfs. In fact, uh, they've already selected some of the first programs to happen, and they will include spectral monitoring of brown dwarfs. Um, the Very Rubin Observatory in uh, Chile is going to be doing a full sky survey essentially every few every few nights, um, and doing that for ten years. And that's going to be an incredible wealth of light curve data to study all kinds of variability, including weather variability in brown dwarfs. And the next space satellite mission, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, at least in the U.S is gonna be launched in 2025, which is only in four years. And it's gonna do a microlensing survey. And I think you guys have probably talked about microlensing survey before. Uh, that's to find you know, planets or other stars that pass or black holes that pass in front of background stars. But it's also gonna provide a really a wonderful photometric data set of anything that's in the field, including brown dwarfs. And there'll be thousands of those that will have extremely high precision light curves. So I expect to learn, hear more about the sort of complex weather of these objects as we get these data sets. Uh, and hopefully this is something that we can start to tie pictures between our solar planets, the e giant exoplanets, and uh, just kind of general processes of atmospheric uh, dynamics. And with that, I will take any questions and thank you very much for listening and your patience. Thank you very much, Dr. Burgesser. That was excellent. All right, so our first question comes from uh, Tani Vanmister, who has asked if amateurs with medium sized telescopes, for example, a, a half meter diameter telescope, can contribute meaningful observations of L or T dwarfs. Uh, so the answer is, uh, I, I say yes. So, so T dwarfs will be hard. Um, and keep in mind that there's two competing factors one is the brightness of the objects, and the other is the fact that they emit more of their light at longer wavelengths. So as you get to T dwarfs in particular, um, you start to get to the point where you have to have infrared cameras to make these measurements because they simply don't emit a lot of light out in the visible. Now, the great thing is, uh, you know, there's uh, new ga uh, uh, gallium arsenide detectors, um, INSBE detectors that are almost off the shelf for relatively cheap. And you can start to buy these infrared cameras um, if, you're, if you're really into it. You can try to do that and buy these infrared cameras. And what we find is that these objects pop out quite brightly. Um, a few, I would say about six or seven years ago, I actually had an amateur astronomer send me a picture of one of my T-dwarfs they had obtained with their, I think it was a 0.6 meter telescope. So that's not far off from the size of the telescope you're talking about. Um, but they had to do it in a, with a pretty red sensitive CCD. So if you're interested in doing this, you want to see if you can explore uh, uh, cameras that are sensitive at longer wavelengths. Um, Saying that, I would say that most of my thesis uh, was done using uh, the 60 inch telescope uh, at Palomar Observatory, um, you know, which is a, a relatively small telescope on its, on its own. Um, and that was enough to find almost all of the T dwarfs in my thesis. So if you have a red sensitive or infrared camera, um, these things are actually not too, not too faint. Um, most of them were discovered by a very small telescope called the two mass telescope. 
Um, and so, and, and only in seven seconds of observation. So um, if you can get to the longer wavelengths, yes, you could see these with, uh, with a half meter telescope. Thank you. All right, uh, Charles Cinnamon had asked if LT and Y dwarfs form in the same way as larger stars, and if uh, any exoplanets have been discovered around any of these brown dwarfs. Great question. So um, for at least for the formation of brown dwarfs, uh, I would say most of the evidence points they do form in the same manner of stars. And, and some of that evidence includes the fact that we see them as isolated objects, right? They're not all orbiting other things. Uh, we see them in the same clusters that we find stars. We find young brown dwarfs next to young stars and, and clusters like the Pleiades. We find old brown dwarfs next to old stars in, in clubular clusters like Omega Sen. Um, you know, we find them in binary systems. So most of the characteristics of brown dwarfs, uh, other things like they have jets when they're young, they have disks that form around them when they're young. All of these share similar uh, characteristics like stars when they form. And so we think to some degree that they're probably very similar in that sense. Um, there is a question about what's the lowest mass, right? How low mass can you have the star formation process go? And that's still an open question. Um, and we're starting to find brown dwarfs, uh, including that Y0855, that's only a few times the mass of Jupiter. And you know, the challenge gets is that's what we see today. We don't know if this is something that formed just like an isolated object that just happened to form that very low mass, or maybe it formed as a planet but got kicked out of its system and is now separated from it so far that we'll never figure out where it came from. Um, this is, so at the margins, this is definitely a question that we're still trying to ask is where does brown dwarfs end? Where do exoplanets begin? And is there overlap in that? Mm -hmm. Now to your second question. Yes, yeah, so the second question is we are looking. So we, we you know, many of you may know a very famous uh, planetary system called TRAPPIST-1 um, that has six, sorry, seven terrestrial planets around it. Uh, that star is 0.08 solar masses. And remember that the brown dwarf limit is 0.07. Uh, so we're pretty close. And we think that it's just a matter of time before we start to find the first planetary systems around brown dwarfs. And there are groups that are looking for them right now. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, the last question came in uh, from George Contenuris who asked if hot Jupiter exoplanets would have similar variabilities due to having very high temperatures. Yeah, so, uh, so one of the figures I had, I, I went through very fast because I was mindful of the time. Um, there is, uh, this is uh, one study that's shown uh, 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 significant evidence of variability from a hot exoplanet. Um, one of the, it's so the, it's really, it's so the brown dwarfs are easy to do this because you can just stare at the brown dwarf and that's all you worry about, right? Um, the problem with hot Jupiters is that they are hot because they're very close to another star. And so somehow you have to decouple you know, the, the exoplanet from the starlight. And, um, and there are some wide systems where the hot Jupiter is just hot because it's very young, that this can be done. Uh, and these are advanced adaptive optics techniques. When we're talking about a hot Jupiter because it's very close to the star, you kind of have to catch the, you know, um, uh, the properties of the, the hot Jupiter, either when it's behind and it's reflecting sunlight back at you or it's coming in front and it's blocking the sunlight. And it's just hard to capture enough of those to see a significant amount of variability. So um, th there's a good chance that they are variable. Um, certainly they're very asymmetrically heated because they're right next to the star. So that's gonna drive all kinds of atmospheric dynamics. The challenge is how do we actually make those measurements uh, when we have to do a lot of work to separate the starlight. Um, mm -hmm. And future large telescopes may allow us to do this by just having enough aperture to, to resolve out the planet in some way and study it just like we study brown dwarfs. But I suspect we are gonna see that they are quite variable as well. Thank you. All right, uh, that's it for the Q&A for now. Um, there are a couple of simple questions left in the Q&A box, and I will ask that as uh, Dr. Genzik begins his presentation, you can go and put some written answers in there, please. Happy to do so. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so our next of today's speakers is a professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Warwick, where he actually helped to found the astronomy group. He has been working with variable star observers for over 20 years now, studying cataclysmic variables, white dwarf binaries, white dwarfs with exoplanets, and white dwarfs with exoplanets. This one is going to be an interesting one. So without any further ado, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Boris Genzik. Thanks, Lauren, for the introduction. And um, thanks, Adam, for warming up the floor. And it, it will be interesting because there will be some overlap between what I will show 
and um, what Adam has shown to you. Um, let me see if I get this started. You should see my screen now. Okay. Um, so the topic is how the world will end. And um, this is not only about planets around other stars, but it's also kind of a look into the future of our own solar system. So the talk will, uh, the talk will split up into four parts. And first I will um, illustrate how planetary systems evolve once their stars run out of hydrogen and evolve off the main sequence. Um, then I will uh, talk you through a number of observational signatures that allow us to find such evolved planetary systems around white dwarfs. Then um, I will go into a very important use that these systems have. Um, besides being kind of fascinating, we can use evolved planetary systems around white dwarfs to measure the bulk abundances, the composition of exoplanetary material. And that's something that we can't do at normal exoplanets orbiting main sequence stars. And then finally, I will highlight two recent um, results where actual planets have been discovered around white dwarfs. So let's go into the first part of the talk, the late evolution of planetary systems. And just have a second and think about what do I mean by that? So here's an um, artist's impression of a planetary system. And it's not the solar system because the nice water rich planet is the fourth one in this uh, planetary system. And if we think back, it's only a little bit over 25, 26 years that we have discovered planets. Now we know that pretty much every star has planets more or less with the precision that astronomers work. And so the questions that we then have is what's the future of these systems? Because eventually these host stars, they will use up all the hydrogen that they burn into helium to produce um, light and radiation. And then the next question is immediately, what's the future of the solar system? And then finally, what can we learn from those evolved planetary systems? So let's start with the solar system. Drawn to scale, we have the uh, architecture of the solar system where we have the innermost rocky terrestrial planets. Then we have an asteroid belt and further out we have the gas giants Jupiter, Saturn and further out Uranus and Neptune. The sun is around halfway through its evolution so it's four and a half billion years old and it has another four and a half billion years to go and it will eventually um, grow into a red giant and just to illustrate that switching to the next slide the sun will become roughly one astronomical unit in size in radius and that means the kind of surface if you think about that of the sun will be where we are right now. Now, that means that um, without a question, Mercury and Venus will be evaporated. And if I go back to the previous slide and switch back and forth, what you see is that something else happens, namely that all the bodies that orbit the sun move out by about a factor two. And so the reason for that is that on the way to become uh, a white dwarf, the sun sheds about half of its mass into a planetary nebula, which is then dispersed into space. And that means that everything going around the sun will move out because there's less gravity. And so that means the, the fate of the Earth is undecided because the Earth may just move out fast enough before it's evaporated by the sun. But that's kind of irrelevant for, for the purpose of this talk and it's irrelevant for all of us. So let's assume the Earth is gone as well. Then in a couple of billion years from now, this is how the solar system will look like. We are left with a white dwarf in the center, which has roughly half the mass of the sun, but it will have still a rocky planet, namely Mars. It will have an asteroid belt and it will have all the giant planets that are further out and it will have all the other ingredients, um, Kuiper belt objects, comets, and so on. So we can firmly predict that the solar system, once the sun has become a white dwarf, will have a large fraction of what is there today. Now, let's move to some of the exoplanets and I show here two of the textbook examples of exoplanets. On the left, we have HR8799. That's a direct image where a coronagraph blocks out the light of the star, and we see four planets. Now, these planets, they're actually fairly large, and they are very comparable to the brown dwarfs that Adam has talked about. They have on the order of 10 Jupiter mass or at the in the region where you transition from something planet size to brown dwarf size. Why do I show this? Because HR8799 is a so-called A-type star. It has a mass of one and a half times that of the sun, and it will leave the main sequence in three billion years. So relatively soon speaking, in terms of astronomical um, times, 
And on the right hand side, there's another example. This is beta pig with, an, with a planet going around it. And beta pig will become a white dwarf in one and a half giga years. So both of these will become white dwarfs and they will have giant planets. And we don't know these systems, they probably have also smaller rocky planets. We simply don't know yet. Okay, so that means the solar system and a number of exoplanet systems that we know will become white dwarfs and their planets will survive. And so it's a fair question. What about the white dwarfs that we see today? Were there once hosts to planet-based systems? Most likely, yes. So for the purpose of this talk, um, exoplanet hosts, which are kind of uh, illustrated by this red range and now extending also further down to the um, M dwarfs that we heard um, about before, they will become white dwarfs. Reality is a little bit more complicated, but uh, for what I want to illustrate, it's simple. They will move down here in the hertzsprung russell diagram. And then because white dwarfs no longer produce energy, they will cool with time and become redder and fainter. Good. So now a quick quiz time and you can type your answer into the chat window. The question is, when was the first data observational evidence obtained that tells us that planetary systems outside the solar system exist? And they weren't understood as such or interpreted, but they were obtained. That's the question. What year were those um, observations obtained? And maybe Lauren can read out if there's some answers coming in. Whoops, sorry, I was muted. Frank Dempsey has said 1997. Uh, John Murrell has said in the 1970s pulsar planet. Okay, yeah, so the pulsar planets, that's very good. The pulsar planets were actually the first detection of planets that were immediately interpreted as such, and they predate the discovery of 51 Peg B, which was the first kind of normalish exoplanets going around a sun like star. And um, there's some question if, like, the Nobel Prize that went to Meyer and Kelo should have been shared with Alex Bolson, who discovered the pulsar planets. A couple of years before them, but that's kind of history. So the answer is 1970. Before I actually show the actual data, I will um, just summarize on one slide all that you need to know about white dwarfs. So the white dwarfs are the burnt out cores of stars like the sun, and more massive, and they typically have masses of somewhere around half a solar mass, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 solar masses. And because of that, they have an extremely high surface gravity and they stratify by weight. And so that means that all the heavy elements that they contain sink down into the core and all the light elements float up to the surface. You can think of it like oil and water that separate. On the left, you have a diagram which shows a cross section through the white dwarf with the bottom being the center of the white dwarf and the top being the surface. And it's on a logarithmic scale. So 99% of the white dwarf are down here and are composed of oxygen and carbon. These are the ashes of burning hydrogen into helium and then helium into oxygen and carbon. And on top of that is a thin layer of helium and a layer of hydrogen. So hydrogen and helium only make up about 1% of the mass, but they cover up all the heavier elements. And that means if we observe a white dwarf, we look at it from the top and we expect to see a pure hydrogen or helium spectrum. So in 1917, Juan Manuel, who was an astronomer at Carnegie Observatories, was studying um, high proper motion objects like uh, low mass, very low mass stars near the Earth. And he took this spectrum, uh, which is a photographic plate, and the actual data is in the middle. And what he noticed is that there is strong calcium H and K absorption in the spectrum of this star. And then he went on and measured the parallax to the star. And he found that the star is very nearby, but very, very faint. And he concluded because F-type stars have strong calcium H and K line, that this is the faintest F star discovered so far. What he didn't know is that he had just discovered the third white dwarf, um, which also turns out to be the third closest white dwarf to the Earth. So what you see on the right-hand side here is a modern spectrum, which um, obtained with one of the very large telescopes in, of ESO in Chile, which shows that indeed the calcium H and K lines are very strong, but we also see iron and magnesium. And now these metals, they shouldn't be there because they sink out of the atmosphere on very short timescales. To illustrate what I mean by short timescales, 
and we show you a movie. And in the top panel, the gray line, that is a spectrum of a white dwarf, which is con heavily contaminated by metals in the atmosphere, which shouldn't be there, but they are there, we see them. And in red, we have a model spectrum that reproduces the amount of metals in the atmosphere now. Now, the important um, feature is the time up here in uh, millions of years. And what I do now is I will switch on gravity and you will see gradually as metals sink out of the atmosphere, the um, red spectrum, the model, will become less and less contaminated by metal ions. Okay, so, and you see, as time goes on, the lines become weaker and weaker. And after about a million, two million years, the lines reach a strength which resemble actually the star observed by Van Maren. And I tried to stop it. Yes, I managed. So after two and a half million years, the spectrum, the model spectrum looks like Van Maren's star. And so that means if we wait two million years and we observe the star again, the metals will be almost gone. And um, that just illustrates the fact that um, white dwarfs do have typically pure helium or hydrogen atmospheres and something contaminates them. And so then the question is, where do these metals come from? Now, this was 1917, and there was a very long hiatus where nothing happened until infrared astronomy that Adam talked about was uh, developed further and infrared detectors became more efficient and available. And so that was the search for brown dwarfs. Now, Ben Zuckerman and Eric Becklin, they were using some of the first generation infrared detectors to find brown dwarfs. And what they had in mind was that rather than searching somewhere randomly on the sky, they would look at other stars in the hope that those other stars may have a brown dwarf companion. And they picked white dwarfs as their target because white dwarfs are very faint. And so the contrast ratio is favorable to detect an equally or even fainter brown dwarf next to a uh, white dwarf. And they found this system in 1987. So that was 70, 70 years after Van Manen's work where they see in the optical wavelength range on the left-hand side, the flux of a white dwarf, and they detect an infrared excess at longer wavelength. And they interpreted that, wrote a paper in Nature, as the detection of a brown dwarf, even though in the paper they speculate that, well, maybe it's not a brown dwarf, but it might be dust, but they concluded that they had detected a brown dwarf. Turns out that their speculation was actually correct. What they had found was a disk of debris of dust around a single white dwarf. That was kind of unequivocally confirmed by a spectrum obtained with the Spitzer uh, space mission, which shows this silicate feature. And again, Adam showed spectra where that feature is an absorption. Here we have it in emission. And silicate, uh, it's not only a silicate feature, it's olivine. And now on Earth, we have olivine, it's green sand. And you can see that here on a picture of. Um, uh, um, of a beach in Hawaii. And so that begs the question, what is green sand going around the white dwarf? Now in 2003, Mike Jura put all the jigsaw pieces together and he conjured that we have planetary systems that survive into the white dwarf stage and then planetary bodies, asteroids or comets come get scattered, they get too close to the white dwarf and the enormous gravity uh, tears them apart by tidal effects. And then the material gets shredded and forms a dusty debris disk around the white dwarf. And that debris rains down on the white dwarf and contaminates the atmosphere with metals. And that is the origin of the metals that we see in those stars, including the white dwarf that Van Manen discovered. Now, going back, this is just kind of a little interesting and nice history lesson. So um, Zuckerman and Becklin discovered what they thought a brown dwarf, or at least they published it as a brown dwarf. And here's the original data from. Uh, from the 1980s. This is now in frequency. So blue is on the right and the infrared excess is on the left. And that just illustrates how far technology has advanced in the last 30, 40 years. Now, writing a paper in Nature is usually the pinnacle of each astronomer's career. And you expect that you harvest a lot of citations. Citations is basically the currency that tells us how good, how important has the paper been. And now if you look at the citation of that particular paper, it nosedived, and that must have been fairly frustrating for the two. But then Spitzer, Spitzer got launched in uh, the early 2000s, observed white dwarfs, and found that these dust disks are actually 
not unique. About one, two, or three percent of all white dwarfs have dust discs that cause infrared excess. And so the citation rate picked up. And so that's a good lesson um, that if you have made a discovery, um, time will tell eventually if, if it was an important discovery or not. So moving on, um, that's where our group and Rory came, became involved into this work. It's winding forward almost another 20 years. So now we're in 2006 and we were working on a spectra from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, both on single white dwarfs and white dwarfs in binaries, binary, binary systems. And I have been inspecting literally thousands of spectra from the, from the um, Sloan Survey. And I came across this spectrum, which has beautiful broad Balma absorption line. So this is kind of a textbook white dwarf, but it has these odd features at red long wavelength, which turn out to be emission lines of calcium. And zooming in, it shows that these lines, they're double peaked. Now, we know from our work on binary stars that if you see double peaked emission lines, that tells you that there's a disk of gas going around the star. And the double peak uh, structure comes from the Doppler effect, which means that um, the gas emitting light that is moving away from us is red shifted to longer wavelength and the gas that is moving towards us is blue shifted. And because a flat disk moves, we have material moving both towards us and away from us at the same time. If you add up all the light from a disk, it comes out as this double peak line profile. So what we had discovered was a white dwarf with a disk of metallic gas, calcium and also iron, um, no companion star, no hydrogen emission, so a pure metallic disk. And we, um, we concluded that that is one of those systems where white dwarf is shredding a planetesimal and we see calcium contained in the planetesimal as an emission line. So we continued to observe that star at the beginning, merely for curiosity over about 15 years of time. And what you see on the left-hand side is the calcium emission lines. And you can see that around 2007, they were kind of textbook-like double peaked, almost symmetric, um, almost symmetric line profiles. But then as time goes on, the profiles change in shape. And so later towards 2010, 12, 13, 13, 14, the blue side, so that's the material that comes towards us, becomes stronger and spikier, whereas the red wing gets stretched out and blurred. And so that tells us that this, the, the, the structure of the material that emits is changing on time scales of, 10, of about 10, 10 years, a decade. So what we did next is we apply a um, method that is called, sorry, that is called Doppler tomography to turn that information into an image. And so that's shown on the right-hand side where we map the intensity of the calcium emission into an image. And um, that literally shows us the distribution where the gas that emits these calcium lines is distributed around the white dwarf. And the white lines that I show on here, they illustrate the side lines across that disk. And so we see that that gas disk is highly asymmetric and it has kind of um, sharp emission on one side and then it's kind of blurring out on the other side. Now, Doppler tomography is a fairly complex technology, but I'll, I'll illustrate that um, with a movie on this slide. Imagine your telescope is at the top of the slide and you're looking down towards the um, disk around the white, uh, that white dwarf. And the color illustrates intensity. So most intensity comes from that red narrow stripe here. And now I will turn on motion and the gas will go around the white dwarf and it will turn clockwise. But at this moment in time, if you are located up here and the gas will turn clockwise, that means when you observe, you have the loudest redshift and most of the light is expected to be in this sharp peak on the right side in the profile. And that's exactly what we see here. So the, um, the panel on the right shows the actual data. And now switching on the movie, you can see how the gas is going around the white dwarf and the projection towards us is changing all the time. And so the data shows, the, the, the plot with the spectrum shows the actual data. And from that data, we can reproject and construct that image. Now, talking about debris disks, 
Um, the breeders are actually fairly common. So stars can have the breeders from the formation of planets, but planets can have the breeders from, for example, moons that got too close. And Saturn has a ring of uh, debris, has a, has a system of debris rings, probably originating from the tidal disruption of the moon that ventures too close to it. And so to scale, this is the white dwarf system that I was talking about, and then Saturn on the other side. So not very different um, in the overall size, only that you replace the planet by a white dwarf, which has roughly half the mass of the sun. Okay, so moving on to solid planetesimals that were detected around white dwarfs. We stay with the same system that uh, white dwarf that has calcium emission lines, and we know it has a gaseous de debris disk. And again, pretty much driven by curiosity, we observe this star with the Granticant telescope, that's a 10 meter telescope on La Palma, and we obtained spectroscopy with a uh, cadence of about two minutes. And we obtained long sequences of spectra because we wanted to probe if these calcium emission lines vary in a stochastic way because um, disks can flicker, and we thought we might see some short term variability. Now, what we found was not what we expected, but it was very exciting because um, it turned out to lead to the uh, discovery of, of a solid planetesimal in that system. So what you see in the top panel is the average spectrum, double peak. Then in the middle uh, panel, we have what we call a trailed spectrum, where the y-axis is basically time. And if you look very hard, you may see that there's a little bit of change in the um, intensity in the left wing that you can just about make out. But to make that stand out clearer, what, what we've done in the bottom panel is that we subtract the average spectrum from each row. And so if we do that, we see that there's a periodic variation in the intensity of the emission lines um, coming out of the data. And it's both the shape and the intensity that's illustrated in the sine curves fitted to the actual data on the right-hand side. And what we measure is that both the shape and the intensity varies with a period of 123 minutes or two hours and it does so in 2017, and we see the, exactly the same period again in 2018. And so that means in astronomy, when you see a period and you see it again a year later, we, you identify a clock, something that is stable within the system, and it is usually linked to the motion or rotation of some part within the system. Now, doing some additional um, analysis, it, it turns out that the only mechanism that we can come up with to explain this signal is a solid planetesimal, which has a mass less than seven Jupiter masses. That's not a good, not, not a very strong constraint. The more interesting bit is that it has to be very dense because it is very close to the white dwarf. And so to withstand the gravity of the white dwarf, it has to have a density of about eight gram per cubic centimeter, which is coincidentally the density of iron and or must have some internal strength that glues it together. So the picture we have in mind is the following, that a planetesimal or a small planet that was differentiated and had an iron core and a mantle made out of rock ventured too close to the, uh, to the white dwarf, got stripped of its crust and mantle that formed the disk and the iron core, which is denser, could survive and is now orbit orbiting the white dwarf at a fairly short distance. Now, again, if we look in the solar system, we see systems, um, we see similar setups, like again, the rings of Saturn are a good analogy. Here's an image taken by Cassini, which shows um, Daphne, one of the moons of Saturn, which is embedded within the ring system. And it opens up a gap and it induces waves um, on both sides in the, um, rings of Saturn. And so what we think is that it is probably that planetesimal orbiting within the debris that causes via collisions or some other interactions, some of the dust turn into gas. And it's then that gas that we see in the calcium emission lines. And it's the, the, the um, glow of that calcium dust that actually closely follows the orbit of that planetesimal, which is kind of illustrated here by the yellowish uh, tail of emission following the planetesimal. Right, so um, the next and final step in the um, signpost of planetary systems is actually transits. Now, it has been a um, fairly 
hard experience to go to exoplanet conferences and talk about this because a lot of exoplanet scientists were very skeptical and like a, a, a fairly common comment that we got was well show us transits then we will believe you that there's really something planetary planetesimal going around this way it was and that's what happened in 2015 andrew van der Borg, using data from the kepler space telescope discovered little dips in the brightness of a white dwarf wd 1145 plus 17 which recurred every four and a half hours now in addition to those transits this white dwarf has metals in its atmosphere, so it's accreting debris, and it has an infrared excess. So it has all the hallmarks of a white dwarf with an evolved planetary system, and it exhibits transits. We obtained um, high resolution, high time resolution photometry of this system very shortly afterwards. And to our astonishment, we detected not just one transit, but flicker, it looks like flickering. So basically the white dwarf is dimming dimming and brightening again all the time. What you see here is a light curve spanning the entire four and a half um, hours of the four and a half hours of the orbital period detected by Van der Borg. And that means there's not one body going around it, but there's many multiple bodies going around it, causing the uh, light of the white dwarf to dim as those objects transit the white dwarf. Now, these are not solid bodies that we see, they would be too small. So asteroids or fragments of planets would be too small to cause the very deep transit that we see. And what we think is that these are solid bodies, fragments, asteroids, and they outgas or release dust clouds. And it's those gas and dust clouds that block the light um, of the white dwarf that we see. Now, what is fascinating is that this system is highly variable. What we see here is light curves obtained over a week night after night and they are face folded on the four and a half hour uh, of the period and you can see that the features they can be tracked from one night to the next and some features appear become stronger and then blur out so what we think is that there is a solid um, fragment of some rocky material that starts to break up releases some dust and then the dust cloud grows spreads out and blocks light of the white dwarf and so observing these um, individual fragments and measuring their period, it turns out that they have almost identical periods. So we tracked six fragments over um, about 150 of their orbital cycles, so tens of days. And we could show that they are stable in period and in orbital location where they are. So you can think of it like a necklace of uh, fragments around the white dwarf. And their periods differ by only a few seconds. So that means they're all co-orbital. And with that information in hand, we could then run a sequence of um, simulations, inputting all the constraints that we have. And the output is that we could constrain the mass of the actual parent body of these fragments to be less than 10 to the 20 kilograms, which is a larger asteroid corresponding to a large asteroid in the solar system. But very interestingly, we could work out the density which comes out as three and a half gram per cubic centimeter. That's exactly the density of rocky bodies. Um, and so using these transits and the fact that we can measure their period stability over long periods of time, we can actually determine something about the makeup of that exoasteroid or exoplanetesimal that is in the process of breaking apart. But there's so much more going on in this system. So, Bruce Gary is a small, uh, small aperture astronomer, and he's been following WD 1145 over all the all years, all the years since the discovery. And he made this amazing plot, which shows he called it an equivalent width. You can think of it as the total amount of light of the white dwarf blocked, averaged around the four and a half hour period. So when Kepler observed the white dwarf in 2014, it, the system was actually very inactive. So it was just 0.2% of the light averaged across the four and a half hours that got lost. But then it very quickly ramped up in activity. So when we observed it, it was at 10%. And that corresponds to all the very deep and numerous transits that I showed you in the previous light curves. And then it went through a, fade, uh, uh, through a fading event, became active again. And so this shows us just the enormous variability in the system and the kind of catastrophic destruction of the planetesimals going around there. Now, that system remained the only system 
uh, with transits for a number of years until Van der Bosch et al. published last year a paper with the second system. Now I show you this light curve and you would probably just nod and say, yeah, that looks very similar. It's kind of asymmetric and very deep transits. Now the very big difference is the time between two transits is not four and a half hours, is not, is not a day, it's 110 days. Now that caused a lot of head scratching because that means that that body is actually far away from the white dwarf most of the time. And so we think currently that it must be on a highly eccentric orbit and we see it blocking light of the white dwarf when it gets close to it at pericenter and then it moves out again. And the speculation is that that is a planetary body that is just beginning to break apart and is on a highly eccentric orbit and may be drawn in by, a by tidal effects onto a shorter period eventually. And now then, um, just a year later, uh, almost a year later towards the end of 2020, Guidi et al. published a paper where they looked at a very large number of white dwarfs and they used Gaia data and the ZPF data from the Zwicky transit uh, factory um, to identify variable white dwarfs. Now, white dwarfs can be variable for all kinds of reasons, but they identified four additional um, white dwarfs with transits from debris material. And so now we are at six systems and they all show extremely different behavior. And that's very exciting. Um, so we are just beginning entering a period where we can study a larger sample of these systems and study in real time how small planetary modes get destroyed, disrupted by their white law hosts. Okay, now this is all cool stuff, but what can we actually do with it? What can we learn from those systems except that planets survive? We can measure bulk abundances, the makeup of planets. And that's very important because that's a key input into planet formation and into the study of exoplanets at main sequence stars because we can't measure their, their properties directly. And that leads to the question, how do we actually measure the um, bulk abundances of planets like Mars, the Earth? We can kind of take samples of the Earth. We can dig down a little bit into the crust, but we can't reach the core. We know the core must be made out of iron because of the overall density of the Earth, but we can't actually directly probe it. Same with Mars, we can send rovers and we may send um, drones that fly through the geysers of Europa, but that's always just scratching the surface. Now in the solar system, the way that we worked out the composition of planets is from collecting meteorites. Now meteorites are fragments of planets, planetesimals, asteroids, moons, and we collect them when they uh, fall down on earth and then we can measure their abundances in the laboratory and measuring uh, many, many meteorites, we see they have different abundances because they have different processes. They have gone through different processes in the past, but we can work out the average abundance of the building blocks from which the Earth and Mars and so on were formed. And then planet formation modelers can take those ingredients and make planets that reproduce the current day properties um, of the solar system. Now, using white dwarf spectroscopy, we do exactly the same. We have planetary bodies, asteroids, that get disrupted, shredded, they fall onto the white dwarf, and that's where we pick them up. We pick them up by a spectroscopy because we know that all the metals that we see are from the accreted planetesimal, and we can then, modeling the data, work back and measure the abundances. And I show you two examples. So these are two white dwarfs, which have very similar properties. They're fairly cool and fairly old. And the, the one in the top panel shows very strong lines of calcium, titanium, and sodium. Now, these are all elements which are sequestered in the crust of the Earth. So these are really in the, in the top part of planets. And then the bottom panel shows a different white dwarf, overall very similar uh, properties, similar temperature, similar age, but it has a spectrum that is totally dominated by lines of iron, and some of nickel, and it has a very, very weak calcium lines. And so now these are the elements that we have um, within the cores of planets that are large enough that they differentiate due to their own gravity. And so the top panel shows a white dwarf that accretes a splinter of a planetary crust, and the bottom panel shows um, a planet that accretes the something like an iron meteorite, a core fragment. And so this table put together by Beth Klein just very recently shows the history of all elements detected and begins with Van Manen's star that I showed at the beginning of the talk in 1917 with calcium, and it ends in 2021 
with the detection of lithium, uh, potassium, and beryllium. So if we look at the periodic table, circled in uh, purple are all the elements that we have detected in white dwarfs um, reflecting abundances of planetesimals. And now Adam mentioned lithium, that lithium in stars is destroyed. And so white dwarfs should never ever contain lithium. And yet just recently, we discovered white dwarfs which have lithium in their atmosphere. It's just this blue line here. And that's lithium in fragments of crust, more specifically oceanic crust accreted by these white dwarfs. So it's planetary material which brings back some lithium into the atmospheres of these white dwarfs. Okay, now this is one of the probably, probably the most complicated figure diagram that I will show, which now takes the abundances that we measure in white dwarfs and compares them with the bulk earth, with the abundances of the earth. And what it shows is all the individual elements as a ratio relative to silicon, because silicon is one of the elements which is a most common in the um, mantle and crust of the earth. And it's easy for us to measure. So we show abundance ratios and we normalize this ratio by the same ratio in the bulk earth. This may sound complicated, but it's actually very simple. It means that any element that sits close to the dotted line of one has the same abundance in the system that we study as in the earth. And material that is above the dotted line is enhanced in the system we study. And um, if we see a dot below the line, then that element is depleted. And so by and large within a factor of five, 10, all the white dwarfs that have been studied have abundances that are similar to those of the earth where the yellow dots are stellar abundances. So this is how a star would look like. And so we see that in particular, the volatile elements, carbon and sulfur would be much, much more abundant in a star than there are in these planets. I will use this diagram in a short while again. So just bear that in mind. Because now I move into the last part of the talk, which is on planets, detections of um, actual uh, detection of actual planets orbiting white dwarfs. And again, it begins with a spectrum from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and some kind of um, head scratching. Several of us were looking at the spectrum and tried to figure out what we actually see. Again, you see a white dwarf with hydrogen absorption lines, a textbook white dwarf, but it has some emission from H alpha. Now we see H alpha emission in binary stars. So for instance, if we have a white dwarf with an M dwarf, a very um, faint companion, or maybe a brown dwarf, the white dwarf will heat up its companion and lead to H alpha emission. And that's what one of my colleagues thought initially. Looking closer, I thought, hmm, there are some features within the noise that look like real emission lines. And it turns out that yes, they are, and they line up with oxygen. And getting some better spectra, we then saw that yes, indeed, this star has double peaked emission lines of oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur. Now, double peaked emission lines, I told you that means there's a gaseous, de gaseous debris or just a gaseous disk around. However, the elements that we see were totally, totally alien to us. We've never seen sulfur or oxygen emission around any single white dwarf or any white binary white dwarf. And now looking at the um, spectrum of the, the atmosphere of the white dwarf, we see oxygen and sulfur in the atmosphere. So that tells us that there's a disk of hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur around the white dwarf, and that material is accreted onto the white dwarf. We don't see hydrogen in the atmosphere because the hydrogen, uh, the atmosphere itself is composed of hydrogen. And so we see a um, gaseous disk, um, but instead of calcium and iron and magnesium, all the elements that we've seen before, we only detect these three elements. Now, the same abundance plot that I showed before, we um, measure the, the red circles are the measurements of hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And so they are roughly uh, consistent with the abundances in solar system meteorites. However, all the elements that we find in the crust, mantle, and core of planets, they are depleted, they are not detected. And some of those detection limits, they are a factor 100,000 below the abundances in the bulk Earth. And that means what we see there is mainly gaseous volatile material and no detection of solids like rocky, um, rocky or icy material. Now, this links back nicely again to the uh, talk from Adam where he talked about the uh, 
uh, atmospheric layers and cloud structures of planets. And so that's something that I had very little knowledge. And while working on this problem, I was reading up on the uh, literature of the solar system. And when I came across this diagram here, I suddenly stopped and I thought, okay, um, in Eurus and Neptune, cool ice giants, we do see hydrogen sulfide and water ice. And that's exactly the three elements that we detect. Now there is additional material, methane, and some components that contain nitrogen, but our spectroscopy is very insensitive to carbon and nitrogen. So we wouldn't detect these elements. What we, what we can detect is sulfur and oxygen and hydrogen. We see those. And so that's when it clicked and we said, okay, this is a white dwarf that has a giant icy planet that may resemble Uranus and Neptune. Now, why is it accreting? The reason is that this white dwarf is hot and it is evaporating the giant planet closer. It's like hot Jupiter. And so we know from main sequence stars that have close in planets that they evaporate planets and drive something like a cometary tail. And the key feature that drives the winds or mass loss from planets from hot Jupiters is the amount of extreme ultraviolet, very high energy photons. Now the white dwarf is hot, it's 20,000 degrees hot. It's hotter than any exoplanet host that we know. And it has plenty of EUV photons. And so what we think we have uh, found here is a white dwarf that is evaporating a ice, icy planet or something that resembles Uranus and Neptune, orbiting the white dwarf at a separation of 10, 15 solar radii, forming that gaseous disk that we detect and then feeds the material with oxygen and sulfur onto the white dwarf. Now, thinking about that, Again, we thought, we, we thought like, what does that imply actually for this, uh, the future of the solar system? Because the sun will become a white dwarf and the solar white dwarf will be very hot at the beginning, about 100,000 degrees. And so this plot shows the um, luminosity in, of the sun as it evolves through the hertzsprung russell diagram and color coded is the luminosity in these extreme ultraviolet high energy photons that will evaporate planets. And so we see that as the white dwarf is very hot, it will have 10 times the luminosity of the sun now, and all of the photons will be high energy EUV photons. And so that means that the sun, when it becomes a white dwarf and is initially very hot, it will photo evaporate. It will drive winds off the giant planets at their locations. They don't have to be close. So, um, we will have mass loss from Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And some of that material that's shown down here in red will make it to the white dwarf that the sun left behind and can be detected. So winding the clock forward again in about 7 billion years, if there is an alien astronomer that points their telescope at the white dwarf left behind by the sun would detect carbon and sulfur and oxygen originating from Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune being accreted by the white dwarf. Now that process is relatively short, only for a couple of million years, but it's a quite exciting um, prediction that uh, our planetary system will be detectable to somebody else in the future. And then finally, just the um, latest discovery from last summer, Andrew van der Boek, um, again discovered this, um, this time using data from the TESS satellite, he discovered a white dwarf which becomes fainter um, with a period of about 1.4 days. And again, it dims by about 50%. So that's not kind of microscopically shallow transit as an exoplanet, as in main sequence exoplanet systems, but it's a very deep transit. Now, the reason that he concluded this must be a planet and not a brown dwarf is that the light curve obtained at optical wavelength. Um, 480 nanometer and in the infrared with Spitzer at four and a half micron is identical. So the object that goes around and blocks light from the white dwarf is basically black, doesn't emit light. And so it is cooler and fainter than any brown dwarf could be, which is illustrated in this diagram here that depending on the age of the system, which isn't terribly con well constrained, the mass of the object orbiting this white dwarf is somewhere around 10 or at most 10, 15 um, Jupiter masses. So it's a, it could be a fairly massive planet, but it could also be a lower mass planet. And the period is, as I said, 1.4 days. Now I said 
planets will evaporate everything close around them. And that means that planet must have um, been transported, scattered, migrated inwards from several AU to a, a period of one and a half days. And that triggered immediately a whole raft of theory papers, speculations of how is it possible to get planets back in onto such tight orbits. This is basically an orbital period corresponding to that of a hot Jupiter around a main sequence star. Now, just the last, last couple of words on that system. Um, what I found most exciting is yes, it is a planet and that's terribly exciting, but what the authors didn't really play out in their papers that this white dwarf is very nearby, that's 25 parsec away. Now, statistic tells us that if something is found very near to the sun, it's probably quite common. Adam made that point about the brown dwarf at two parsec distance. Now, 25 parsec is still very nearby. In fact, there are only about 300 white dwarfs within 25 parsec. Now, if you think about it, this system is transiting. That means we have also a geometric factor because we need to look into the orbital plane. And that tells us, well, even if there were 50 white dwarfs within 25 uh, parsecs with planets, we would only see one or two or three that transit because of the geometry. And so to me, that suggests that planets on close orbits around white dwarfs are probably fairly common, but we haven't really searched hard enough. And I predict that we will find many more planets orbiting white dwarfs and causing transits in the years to come. And so with that, I um, come to the, to, the, uh, to the end of the talk and just summarize the key points that planetary systems around white dwarfs are as common as they are around main sequence stars. And that may be at the beginning counterintuitive because white dwarfs is the end stage of stellar evolution and you think it might destroy planetary systems, but planetary systems are very robust and will survive in most cases that evolution. And they, detail, they provide us with detailed insight into the abundances of, of exoplanets and now also into the atmospheres of um, exoplanets. They can tell us about how much water is out there because again, we can detect instances where white dwarfs accrete water rich icy bodies. And they tell us something about the architectures of planetary systems around A and F type stars which is again, very difficult to achieve at main sequence stars because those stars are extremely bright and they, um, they're not very uh, favorable for both radio velocity or transit studies. And I'll stop here and take some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Genzik. That was excellent. All right, so um, first I've got a couple of questions of my own while people are typing. Uh, my First question is relating to limiting magnitudes. So for uh, amateurs who are interested in observing these kind of systems, uh, is that feasible? What kind of telescope would you need to be able to observe some of these systems? Yeah, so the, the transiting systems, they are the, the uh, unfortunately, this, no, this plot doesn't have um, apparent magnitudes there between 17th and 19th magnitude. Now, because the transits are very deep, they're like 50%, you don't need to have high precision. Mm -hmm. And the transits are also moderately long. So um, in fact, I'm, I'm working with a few um, small telescope observers at the moment to follow up one of those systems, uh, this one down here, ZTF0923. And it is possible to detect the, the kind of variability with uh, typical amateur equipment. And, and Bruce Gary, who followed up the WD1145, has demonstrated like how much detail you can pull out if you spend a lot of time on these systems. That's great news. I might be interested in doing that then, and I'm sure that a lot of our observers in the audience would. All right. Um, okay, my, my other question was also observational. Uh, relating to spectra, what kind of spectral resolution are you looking at to detect the splitting of the lines? You need a resolution of, say, 2000. OK. Um, so like resolution of an, an angstrom or two or three at calcium H and K. So this calcium H and K are the strongest lines. And you can detect them at, yeah, at, at a resolution of around 1000, 2000. Okay. Other elements, it's harder. You need to get up to resolution of 
three, four thousand, but you don't need to go beyond that. So okay. you, you don't you don't need to go to kind of a shell type ten thousand to mm -hmm. see those lines. That's good news. I might have a a, a slit spectrograph in that range soon. So I'm going to yeah. try yeah. going after that. Okay. Uh, so if we have any questions from the audience, go ahead and submit them. Right now, the only one I'm seeing is from Michael Poxon, who said that uh, your mention of planetary migration anticipated his question. So I guess he no longer has something to ask. We're going to give it one minute. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if none come in because honestly, that was really well explained the whole way through. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, by all means, if anybody is interested um, observing these transiting systems or contributing some data, just um, get in touch. All right, Roger that. All right, so it looks like that's probably it for our questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and Hold on a second. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Bergasser, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, I can't use the Q and A, so I'll, I'll take the uh, opportunity to ask questions to, to you, Boris. Um, so you know, uh, the it is quite amazing how deep the transits are, and of course, not surprising when we're talking about these tiny little stars. Um, any chance that we're going to detect a giant planet transit that could actually completely block out the white dwarf? And uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the the one system. The one system that is transiting, which um, probably is a giantish planet, that's just a grazing transit. If the inclination was a bit higher, you would have a white dwarf that com completely disappears every 1.4 days. And that may actually be one of the reasons why not more of these systems have been found, because detecting a dimming that's what a lot of software can do, but detecting the absence of a star is much harder. And, and a lot of software or a lot, a lot of analysis pipelines, they're just simply not set up to look for stars that periodically disappear altogether. Yeah, I know from my work that people look for short brightenings uh, and it's, it's tuned to that, but yeah, having something that, that completely goes out, which is the opposite direction, we just may not have the search algorithms. That's interesting. Absolutely. Question. Um, so I showed this one slide where I compared the, the white dwarf with the Earth. So just to bear that in mind, you don't even need a giant planet. The Earth would pretty much block most, most of a white dwarf if it's perfectly aligned. So wow. uh, super Earths and Neptunes, if, they are, if you have a, a favorable inclination, will totally block the light of a white dwarf. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. All right, uh, well, we had one question come in the Q&A box, but it looks like it's not a question. It's just Mark Harris saying that both lectures were so well explained that no questions have come up, which I have to agree with. Okay. So uh, in that case, I'm gonna go ahead and close the webinar. Uh, if you will allow me, I'm gonna switch over the screen share real quick. There we go. All right, first of all, I would like to extend a huge thank you to both of you, Dr. Bergasser and Dr. Genzik for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. I would also like to thank again our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APASP, has used ACP Experts AI Scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields hands-off at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AVSO. Be sure to check out their website for more about their work. Today's webinar has been recorded and the recording will soon be made available for free on the AAVSO's YouTube channel, where you can find a full library of webinars just like these. Go check it out. And while you're there, consider subscribing to our channel. 
Not only will you get notified each time a new lecture is posted, but by hitting that little subscribe button, you will be increasing our educational reach, making YouTube more likely to suggest our videos to others. It's just one more way that you can help support the AAVSO. Speaking of support, this webinar series is being supported by you, the viewer. So please, if you're not a member, join the AAVSO. AAVSO membership comes with a wide array of benefits, including free access to our mentorship program. If you want to become an observer and witness some of this exotic astrophysics for yourself, but you just don't know where to start, our mentors can help. If you are already an AAVSO member, don't forget to renew your membership. And as always, we would be so grateful if you would consider donating to the AAVSO. Every donation matters and goes towards making programs like this come to life.